Hello and welcome to Counterintuitive, a podcast made in association with the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society at King's College London. My name is Dr Paul Segar and I'm a lecturer in political theory here at the Department of Political Economy at King's College London. Each episode in this series, I'll be interviewing an academic or thinker or journalist and asking them to defend a counterintuitive idea or position that they hold. I'll be playing the role of devil's advocate, or at least a sceptical inquirer, in order to see where the ideas take us. Of course, whether you agree with me or my guest is, in the final instance, entirely up to you. This week on Counterintuitive, I'm speaking to Professor Claire Chambers. Claire is Professor of Political Philosophy and a Fellow of Jesus College at the University of Cambridge. She is a specialist in liberal political theory, feminist political philosophy, theories of social justice and ideas of social construction. She's the author of Sex, Culture and Justice, The Limits of Choice, which came out in 2008, and also Teach Yourself Political Philosophy, A Complete Introduction, co-authored with Phil Parvin in 2012. Today, however, I'll be speaking to Claire about her latest book, Against Marriage, An Egalitarian Defence of the Marriage-Free State. I'll be asking Claire why exactly she thinks that the state should not recognise marriage. Dr. Claire Chambers, welcome to Counterintuitive. Thank you very much. Hello. So, Claire, tell us, why are you against marriage? Well, of course, the first thing to say is, you know, what is marriage and what part of it am I against? Now, you might think of marriage as being something about to do with relationships. So marriage is, you know, when you, when you think about marriage, one of the first things that comes to mind is, is a wedding, a celebration of your relationship, a party, you know, love, romance, commitment, stability, all those sorts of values. Um, and it's not that that I'm against. That's not the thing that I'm objecting to in my work. So instead, the sort of marriage that I'm objecting to, that, that I'm against, is marriage as a state-recognised institution. So it's the thought that there is something particular about a certain kind of relationship that the state should recognise, should regulate, and should endorse as being the better kind of relationship for people to have as compared to other relationships or no relationship at all. So then why be against that? Why be against the state recognising marriage? Well, there's lots of reasons, and I suppose they boil down to two big uh, different principles, um, equality and liberty. Um, and I can talk about each of those in turn. Yeah, go for it. Why, why don't you start with equality? Okay, so it's a real sort of commonplace criticism of the institution of marriage that feminists have been making for decades, for centuries, that marriage has long been an institution to subordinate women. It's been an institution that has existed um, largely to ensure that family property and the associations between families and between men and women have been regulated in a clear way along patriarchal lines. Women have characteristically lost most, if not all, of their legal independence on marriage. And so we have lots of feminists, John Stuart Mill, Mary Wollstonecraft, criticizing marriage for its legal inequalities. And now you might think that that sort of critique of marriage is just not apt anymore because we no longer have that gender inequality in the legal regulations of marriage. It's no longer the case that women and men are treated unequally in marriage. Um, so then you might think, well, there's another kind of way that marriage has historically been unequal, which is that it's historically been confined only to different sex couples and same sex couples haven't been allowed to enter into marriage. And that's another problem for equality. And again, you might think, well, that inequality no longer exists anymore. So in a liberal society like the UK, where we recognize same sex marriage, where men and women are treated equally in marriage by the law, what's the problem of equality? And I'd say, well, there's a variety of different problems for equality that still exist. So one problem is that that sort of history and tradition of marriage still has a sort of symbolic effect on the way we think about the institution now. So a lot of what we are doing when we get married is we are participating in a tradition we're participating in ceremonies which get their meaning and their significance from precisely that traditional status that they have. So if someone gets married now, what marriage means, what it represents, what it symbolizes, does still have a, a connection to, to its past. So that sort of symbolic um, connection to inequality is still there. But even if we set the symbolic aspects of it aside, Still, marriage as a state-recognised institution creates inequalities. It creates inequalities just most simply between people who are married and who are not married. 
And that's just a kind of inevitable aspect of having a state recognized institution. You create an inequality between people who are in and people who are out that institution. And so that means that state recognized marriage is a problem still for equality between married and unmarried couples and between people who are married and people who are not in a couple like relationship. Great. So that's the equality side of it. What about liberty? Well, so when we think about what the state is doing with respect to marriage, it's doing a variety of things when it recognizes marriage. One thing that it's doing is it's structuring various sorts of regulations around marriage. So it's saying that whether you're married or not makes a difference for things like immigration, tax, inheritance, who's your next of kin, that sort of thing. So it's creating a regulatory structure that is based on marriage. It's also, in doing that, it's also making a, uh, a sort of public statement about the value that is given to relationships that fit that structure. So when the state recognizes marriage, it's saying, look, there's something special and valuable about relationships that fit this mold, which are, you know, two people in a monogamous, committed, romantic partnership. That's a kind of relationship that has more meaning, more significance than other relationships. And so we might compare you know, the significance of marriage to the significance of a long-term friendship or people who live with us with a sibling long-term or people who live alone or people who have more than one partner and so on. And when the state makes that very public declaration that one kind of relationship, one kind of family structure is more valuable, more important than others, then what it's doing is making an intervention in claims about how people ought to live their lives. It's saying that there's a one particular way of life that we, the state, recommend, respect and exalt above others. And that's a constraint on people's liberty to arrange their lives in a variety of different ways. It, it's an intervention in the controversial questions that ought really to be left to individuals to work out amongst themselves. So, so to clarify here, there are two arguments in play then. One, that marriage given its historical formation and where it's come from, embodies certain sexist, patriarchal uh, residues and overtones. So even though marriage has become more equal in many respects between men and women than, say, in the 19th century, um, we, you know, women are entitled to much more of, say, their husband's property and to rights over children, it nonetheless still um, necessarily contains patriarchal, sexist uh, problems with it but also that there's a further argument here which is that it discriminates by being state recognized against non-heterosexual in particular romantic relationships so there's two arguments here i take it and which of those is the one to you that's really most important and most decisive well i think generally my the arguments about equality for me are the most important as compared to the arguments about liberty but then those two that you just described are both arguments about equality, right? There are arguments about equality in sort of symbolism, in, in representation, recognition, and there are arguments about equality in sort of the current um, legal status of people. And the argument about the historical sort of residues of inequality, I think does still have a profound impact on the way we think about the institution. I mean, there are so many aspects of marriage practice that just retain that deeply sexist sort of symbolism ranging from you know quite minor aspects of the traditional christian wedding ceremony things like the father giving away the bride and and you know the white dress symbolizing virginity these sort of very sort of symbolic aspects but they do retain quite, quite a great deal of significance to practices like um the fact that women typically change their name on marriage and change their title on marriage from miss to missus and that that is something again that structures women's lives constantly so you know every woman who goes to buy something in a shop will be asked if she wants delivery or something you know what's her title is it miss or missus you know and on the phone and these everyday kind of uh, interactions so those sort of residues do do carry on and they are important and they also relate to the extent to which people think that marriage is a necessary feature of a sort of successful life so i think we still have a very strong sense that an unmarried woman beyond a certain age is you know is, is a problem that she ought to worry she ought to concern herself with why she's single and why she's unmarried in a way that is that sort of stigma is not applied to men so i think that is still an important aspect of the institution but the big question is whether that will change whether that inequality that relates to historical sexism um, and heterosexism will sort of ever weigh and this was a big debate in um, amongst uh, lesbian gay and queer theorists when thinking about same-sex marriage right so 
the movement for same-sex marriage has been enormously popular and successful politically. But not very long ago, perhaps 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there was significant disagreement within gay, lesbian and queer theorists and activists about whether same-sex marriage actually was something that would be good for people in, in those relationships. Because there's a sense in which um, clearly the demand for same-sex marriage is a move for equal rights. It's a recognition of the equal status of people who are in um, same-sex relationships. It's a clearly egalitarian move in that sense. But at the same time, it is a demand that lesbian and gay people take on the sort of symbolic residues and meanings of a traditionally heterosexual, heterosexist, sexist institution. It's a demand that lesbian and gay relationships fit that mold and show themselves to be respectable and um, committed and traditional and not, you know, not different from what is taken to be the norm. So I do think that that historical equality still persists. But whether the existence of same-sex marriage will successfully work to change the meaning of marriage as we understand it symbolically, I mean, that remains to be seen and something that I don't have, have the answer to yet. We're just going to have to see how that turns out. Um, so then the question of the unequal treatment between people who are married and people who are not married, who might be straight, lesbian, gay, single mothers, single fathers, poly, you know, a whole variety of people might be unmarried. I mean, that inequality is something that, again, is amenable to, to change and to, to reform. So it depends partly on what the laws of marriage are in any given society, what kinds of privileges and rights people get on marriage that they don't get um, if they are unmarried. Uh, and that's something, again, that can change over time. So one of the huge changes in marriage law um, in England and Wales recently has been the recognition of civil partnerships for different sex couples. And that sort of provides a different way of regulating relationships that doesn't recall these sexist traditional meanings of, of marriage, but that enables couples to get legal recognition and status and protection for their relationships. Um, so that's been an important change. But it's not enough because it's still the case that couples have to be in a marriage-like relationship to get the recognition. And really importantly, what you still have to do with a civil partnership is you still have to go along and register your relationship as a civil partnership. You have to make that move to opt in to the institution. And the huge problem then is what happens to people who have not done that when relationships break down. Right. So that, that, that brings up loads of fantastic issues we can get deeper into. And I definitely want to come back to the civil partnerships and gay rights question. But just before we do that, what would you say to somebody who said, well, you know, why shouldn't the state privilege marriage as a particular form of relationship? Doesn't it embody all kinds of important things such as raising children and showing commitment and having a monogamous um, uh, relationship over time? And you know, why is it a problem for the state to, uh, to endorse you know, that kind of thing? Mo most people think that marriage is good and marriage should be supported and it seems to that, that you want to really say something that's actually quite radical here so, so what would your reply be on that front well so that's really interesting so there's two questions there buried in your question so one is do we agree that these various things you mentioned are are valuable and valuable in a way that the state ought to promote that's one question and then the second question is if we do agree is marriage the right mechanism for promoting and, and protecting those sorts of attributes. So take children. So one of the most common reasons people might give for having the state recognise and promote marriage is precisely the idea that marriage is good for children, that there's something beneficial to children about having married parents and that therefore we ought to encourage people to get married. Now there's a lot of problems with that view. The biggest problem is actually whether it's true, the empirical question of whether it's true that marriage benefits children. And the key question there is what you're comparing marriage to. So what seems to be the case in the evidence that we have is that what is really important to children is not so much whether their parents are married, but whether their parents are, are stable, whether they have a stable home life, whether their family structure is one of stability. And it also matters to children, of course, whether they, their parents, their family is, is socioeconomically stable, whether it's in poverty, whether it's, it's, um, it has adequate uh, resources and so on. But the specific aspect of marriage, the parents being married, that isn't really what helps children. And even if it was the case that children did better with married 
parents than unmarried parents. The question then would be what the policy implication ought to be from that. And one answer might be, well, we should encourage all parents to marry. But that's still going to leave you with the fact that there will be many children whose parents are not married. That's not a fact that can be wished away. Even if every single parent wants to be married, there will always be people who are, are widowed or divorced or who are pregnant by surprise and who, you know, women who become pregnant and who do not have a partner they can marry. So there are always going to be children with unmarried parents. And if marriage benefits children, if marriage gives children an advantage, then what the state policy ought to be is actually to focus its attention and support on the children of unmarried parents. And it ought to be focusing there rather than on encouraging um, or increasing the stigma against children of unmarried parents. So this is generally the case with lots of the uh, features that you just noted, which is that the, the values that we might want the state to promote are not confined to marriage. Marriage is a proxy for those values. So the state perhaps ought to be promoting and supporting parenthood, and it ought to be encouraging and recognizing the significance of parenthood and encouraging parents to create a life that's as stable for their children as possible, whether that's in a marriage or as a single parent or in an unmarried relationship, whatever it might be. That would be the sort of more um, apt response to that value. The various other arguments you give about you know, monogamy and, and tradition and stability would have to have arguments for each of those values and would have to see whether and why marriage was the correct or the best way of promoting each of those values. And I, I have doubts that marriage is doing more than being a proxy for those other more fundamental values. So what if somebody said, okay, that's all fine and well and good, but what about my liberty, mine and my partner's liberty to have a ceremony where you know, perhaps the, the, the woman wants to wear the white dress. Maybe she doesn't care about its patriarchal overturns. Maybe she even endorses them and says, well, you know, why shouldn't I be allowed to, to get married? And other people can do what they want. Um, but, but being against marriage, you know, that's not fair but, uh, to people who want to get married. What's, what's the position there? Right. So my position is that people should absolutely be permitted to get married in the way that you would send, that you say, you know, weddings are not going to be banned in my vision of a marriage free state. So people would be perfectly at liberty to engage in any kind of religious or secular ceremony of marriage that they chose with any kind of, you know, dress and vows and comments and, and so on that they chose. The question is whether that should have any impact on their status as recognised by the state. And my argument is it just simply shouldn't. So if a person or a couple want to marry in a very traditional way, you know, perhaps in a church or you know, with, the, with the white dress, and with all those traditional things, absolutely that is their liberty, that is their right to do so, and I wouldn't want to prevent that. But the question is whether that should give them any particular legal status, and my argument is that it shouldn't. Right. So just going back to then to the question of gay rights and the expansion of marriage-like arrangements, so allowing gay marriage, certain kinds of civil partnerships, what about the gay couple who say, well, this is all very well and good about, in theory, everybody should have equal status, but in practice, we've had to fight to get to a position where we can be recognized as at least equal to, say, heterosexual monogamous couples. And so that the institution of marriage, sure, in an ideal world, maybe we'd abolish it and just have some alternative arrangement we can discuss in the future. But right now, marriage is really important. Gay marriage is really important for gay rights because we do live in an unequal world. And this is an important step step towards getting to something like equality, at least for people like us. So I'm very sympathetic to that kind of argument. I think in many contexts, that's going to be exactly right. So um, I was and do still fully support the recognition of same sex marriage, right? My view is if you're going to have uh, state recognized marriage, then of course you should include same sex marriage within that. Um, so I would I want to distinguish, I suppose, um, what is the politically expedient move in any given time and place, right? what the best route towards greater equality is from where we want to end up ultimately. And so one of the responses we saw in some states in the USA when the Supreme Court there ruled that states had to recognize same-sex marriage was precisely a kind of homophobic response that, well, then we won't recognize marriage at all as a way of avoiding having to recognize same-sex marriage. And I think that's you know, clearly a regressive anti-egalitarian move that I would not support. So I would want to distinguish a kind of a political perspective on a particular reform in a particular political time and place from an idea about what, where the ultimate destination ought to be. So in that same vein, I think that the move to recognise civil partnerships was an improvement on the status quo, but I wouldn't want us to end, end there. So yeah, at any one time and place, we can think about the next move for equality. 
And I think on balance, um, it will have proved to be important and vital that the move to recognize state same-sex marriage will, I think, have ultimately um, improved the standing and equal status of lesbian and gay people. Um, the question is whether, whether it will also bring with it pressures to assimilate that will be long-term and difficult to reject, or whether it'll just be a stepping stone to even greater equality. Great. So I suppose the question then becomes, if we agree that we want to stop privileging a certain kind of relationship, for example, uh, heteronormative or, or between a man and a woman, um, and we say we don't even want to just expand that model, say, to include gay people, but we want to take account of people who are in, say, long-term friendship relationships or care relationships, um, which may not be romantic or sexual, but have important life dynamics where people rely on each other and may in turn be entitled to legal claims on each other, aren't we going to need some kind of legal regime Boat, right because we can't presumably just abolish marriage and then just have a big free-for-all because in particular that would put many women in back into a status of vulnerability so is the idea here that we're going to set up a system of contracts where people in um, certain kinds of relationships go to the state and say okay well we we are in this kind of relationship and we want to specify these rights and duties that we hold against each other um, and if they go wrong then we want to be able to claim some kind of legal redress uh, but we do that on a kind of piecemeal basis so that all kinds of different people can set up their own kinds of contract rather than just you know the marriage being the default and either that or nothing for uh, for everybody else is that the vision here well, I certainly would endorse the way well, you started with that question, which is that I am not in any sense arguing for the deregulation of relationships, right? So the argument that marriage shouldn't be recognized by the state is not an argument for, you know, laissez-faire, let everybody do what they please with no legal consequences. It's sort of premise of my argument that well-designed um, regulation serves to protect people from vulnerability and is necessary and that being outside of the purview of well-designed just regulation makes people vulnerable and is an injustice. So that's, that's the kind of the premise here. Um, of course, the, the key there is that the regulation should be well-designed and should be just, but that, that's the sort of assumption we're working with. So then what would just regulation of personal relationships look like? Well, there's various reasons why we need that regulation. I can sort of identify three broad kinds of reasons. So one is that relationships, personal relationships can make people vulnerable. Right, people are vulnerable in relationships because they become um, interdependent financially, emotionally, they share property, they share a home, um, they intertwine their, their lives in a way that makes them liable to vulnerability. So that's something that the state needs to get involved with. Um, there are matters that need to be specified in law. The law needs to have an answer to questions like who owns this property, who is responsible for these children. Um, and that's particularly relevant if relationships break down, if there's disagreement, dissolution of a relationship. So the, the law needs to know some facts about questions like that. Um, but then there are also ways in which individuals or couples or people in relationships might want to take on commitments to each other. So they might want to make promises to each other to be together for a certain amount of time or forever to share property and so on so there's those three areas that need regulation right the, the fact that people can be vulnerable um, the fact that there are some areas that need to be specified in law and the fact that people might want to take on commitments to each other now you suggested that contract could be the answer and it might be the answer sometimes but it's not the answer that i argue for is the right way of replacing the regulation of relationships through marriage and there are various problems with contracts. So the most obvious problem is that contracts do not help you if people haven't made a contract, right? So you still need regulation to cover those questions, questions of vulnerability, questions of um, you know, who owns what property, who's responsible for these children. You still need regulation to cover those questions, even if the people involved haven't previously made a contract. And if you've got regulation that covers those situations, even where there is no contract, what do you need the contract for? What's the contract doing? Well, a contract in that situation is operating only as a way of allowing people to escape the obligations they would otherwise have in law. So then we've got a kind of two tier regime, right? We've got the default regulations that the state needs to design and put in place and have, have be, be just and well-designed to protect people from vulnerability, to specify questions of 
um, ambiguity in law, you've got those regulations, and then you've got a separate set of obligations that people have contracted to. But of course, the point about contracts is that when they're used as a legal mechanism, they only make any, have any impact in that respect if they're enforced by the state. So writing up a legal contract with your partner, can you not hear? I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, actually, I was muted. Your audio just cut out um, briefly. Okay. So if you just back up to the start of the, the last chunk of what you were saying, um, <laughs> we should be all contracts? right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll get back up a bit and you might have to do some clever editing. Yeah, yeah we, that, that's no problem. Okay. So if you have a contract regime, you then have a two tier system where you have a set of default regulations that the state has put in place to protect people from vulnerability and to secure um, certainty in matters that the law needs to know about. And we're assuming that those regulations are well designed. They're just regulations. That's the assumption of, of thinking through this, um, this proposal. And then you've got a second set of obligations that people take on through their contracts, which conflict with deviate from those default state regulations. And then a contract really is a demand that the state enforce that agreement. That's what makes a contract different from simply having a discussion with your partner and agreeing some ground rules between yourselves. Once you change that into a contract, you then get the state involved and you ask the state to enforce that agreement. And if we actually start to think through what it would mean for the state to enforce relationship contracts, we come up with a number of really unpalatable potential consequences. So what if people draw up contracts for their relationship which are unjust, which deviate from the default regulations in ways that are unjust or unfair to one of the path partners? It doesn't seem that we ought to have the state be um, enforcing that, using it as an instrument to enforce that injustice, because that seems to undermine the whole point of the regulations, which in the first place is to protect people from vulnerability and to create um, a fair and equal situation. But people might also want to draw up contracts to cover areas of their relationship that are not covered in law. So if you read the literature on relationship contracts, you see people proposing things like, well, people could draw up a relationship contract that says <clears throat> that um, maybe in the first five years of a relationship, one partner's career gets priority. And in the second five years, another partner's career gets priority. So in the first five years, you know, if we need to move house for that partner's job prospects will do so in the second five years, we'll do it for the other partner and so on. And these kind of contracts can look really kind of egalitarian on the face of it. They can be drawn up in a way that seems to be like a really fair, sensible agreement. But once you think about what it would mean for the state to enforce a contract like that, you actually get a dystopian nightmare. So if you have a situation where, you know, year seven, um, it's my turn to have my career prioritized, I get a job offer on the other side of the world and I demand that my partner and I move there and my partner doesn't want to move to the other side of the world. Well, the thought that the state ought to get involved and force my partner to move the other side of the world so as to uphold the relationship contract we drew up is not only, as I say, a dystopian of nightmare of, you know, over state overreach. There's no way in which a relationship could survive that kind of state coercion. So the idea of getting the state involved in these kinds of contracts just looks much more difficult than it might seem at, at first, more difficult and more undesirable. So my argument then is that contracts can be used in some situations. They can be a useful way of allowing people to deviate from default regulations where that suits them. But they have to be constrained by questions of, of justice and liberty and equality. They can't be a sort of free for all and they can't be the only thing that affects um, the regulation of relationships. So the argument, as you've put forward, is clearly intended to be a very egalitarian one. It's about treating all kinds of relationships equally and thus all people equally. But might there not be a reply that says, but isn't this in practice going to be quite exclusionary of some people in particular, which is the religious and people for whom marriage is an especially important part of a lived life because it has a particular sanctimony or a particular status within their worldview. And of course, not everybody shares this worldview, um, but won't religious people in particular feel 
alienated by this view? And isn't this argument perhaps um, anti-religious necessarily in some ways? And perhaps it's less egalitarian. Perhaps, perhaps this is just a price you're willing to pay. Um, but is there not something to be said here about in practice um, the exclusion of certain kinds of worldview from the marriage-free state? So I think there are many ways actually in which the marriage-free state should be welcomed by religious believers. Because what we have in the current context is we have the state making um, legally sanctified uh, um, decrees about what marriage is and what has to happen for a marriage to exist at all. And those state decrees can conflict sometimes quite considerably with the views of people of um, particular religious faith. And again, the move to same-sex marriage is an obvious example here. When the state moved to legalize same-sex marriage, there were many religious believers who were profoundly uh, distraught at that prospect. Um, for example, the Catholic bishops of England and Wales wrote a very heartfelt critique. And one of the aspects of their critique was that marriage as an institution has a specific meaning, a sanctified meaning given by God, which proposals to recognize same-sex marriage violated. Now, if the state no longer recognizes marriage, then it's no longer getting involved in those kinds of religious questions. It's no longer saying what marriage means, and it leaves religious understandings of the institution intact in that sense. So there's a distinction then between the legal recognition and status that people have from the state and the meaning of an institution like marriage in a religious context. And that is, you know, taking us back to the question we discussed earlier about the way that state recognition of marriage comes up against problems of liberty, because it's intervening in those matters of great importance and controversy in a way that undermine some people's deeply felt convictions. But there is still an aspect of my argument that does then come up against religious faith in the way that you suggest, which is that the question then that we're left with is what, if anything, the state should do about those religious marriages that still exist in the marriage-free state. And religious marriages still exist because you remember a while ago I said, you know, in my view, you should absolutely still be free to have any kind of wedding ceremony that you like, to participate in any kind of um, what I call private marriage, i.e. non-state recognized marriage that you like. And that means that religious marriage will still exist in the marriage-free state. It just won't have legal status. And so then the question is, well, should there be any limits on what religious marriages can be like? Should the state seek to regulate them in any way? Um, and I argue in the, in the book that they should. The state sh should still have a certain amount of um, purview over religious marriages, not to determine, as it were, the, the meaning of the institution in some sanctified sense, but the state does still have a legitimate interest and a need to ensure that any marriages that people enter into in a religious or secular context do not fundamentally undermine their, their equal status and their, their, their basic rights. And so that can mean that religious practices of recognizing marriages only on discriminatory basis, for example, only recognizing different sex marriage, not same sex marriage, or applying um, rules of marriage and divorce within the religious context that are profoundly unequal for women and men, they still can come up against the state's legitimate interest in securing equality for all. Great. So on one reading, this is an argument about what philosophers call ideal theory, that if we had, um, say, a magic wand and we could wave it and create a more just society, the vision you have is the more just society in this regard would not recognize marriage, well, the state would not recognize marriage, still be able to have ceremonies, still be able to have all kinds of commitments. But in terms of people's legal entitlements and their claims against each other, these would not be differentiated based on whether or not they were in a marriage. But what about here and now? Um, what are the policy implications for getting to the marriage free state? Because clearly, we're a long way away from from that condition at the moment. So what is it that you would propose or like to see as steps that we can take towards your, your vision of justice, so to speak, knowing that we're, we're still quite a long way from it as we stand? So I think that question really does depend fundamentally on, on, on the, the, the jurisdiction we're talking about. So let's think first about um, our own jurisdiction. So in the United Kingdom, family law is, is divided. So England and Wales has its own family law. Scotland has its own family law. Some things are different in, in Northern Ireland. So we get into kind of complexities here about precisely which jurisdictions are relevant. But let's think about England and Wales to begin with. So I mentioned earlier the, the recognition of 
um, different sex civil partnerships which came into play um, last year as a result of a concerted campaign from the Equal Civil Partnerships um, campaign and a successful Supreme Court case taken by a couple, Rebecca Steinfeld and Charles Kaiden, who argued that the prohibition on um, different sex civil partnerships violated their equal rights and they were ultimately, um, their, their, their claim was upheld. So that's a real improvement. And the real reason it's an improvement is because it then provides a mechanism for enabling couples to get the legal protection that currently is um, only available through marriage or civil partnership without having to participate in that symbolic institution that they may find profoundly unappealing or objectionable. But what that regulation leaves untouched is the problem of a whole host of other vulnerabilities. And one of the most pressing, I think, in the current situation is the vulnerability of cohabiting couples. So cohabiting couples who are in what looks like a marriage, but who are not married and who do not have a civil partnership are currently treated in law as if they are completely separate individuals. And this is something that most people do not understand. So we have um, what's called a myth of common law marriage, where most people um, in England and Wales believe that if they live together in a monogamous committed um, partnership, that the law will treat them as if they were married. And that's not the case. And this can face all sorts of really serious problems, um, particularly problems related to, um, to separation. So if a committed long-term civil partnership breaks up, the people who are in that partnership will be given no um, entitlement to a share of each other's property or income. It'll simply be a question of, you know, who, whose name is on the title deeds of a house, who earns the salary. And that's something that can cause um, serious inequality and poverty for particularly for women who might be um, engaged in unpaid domestic and caring work so they you know, the, the man supports the family with his salary the woman supports the family with her um, by looking after the children in the house and in a marriage or a civil partnership if that sort of relationship breaks up the woman will be entitled to financial support and the share of the shared assets of the, fa of the family in a, in a cohabitate, cohabiting relationship she'll be entitled to, to nothing and that's a huge vulnerability, um, which I say many affects many people, mainly women, and many people do not know that they are vulnerable in that situation. So there is all sorts of things we could and should do to protect cohabiting couples. The Law Commission um, made a report on this several years ago, which you know really recommended quite wholesale changes, which would make a big difference. Um, we can also see various ways in which the law, as it currently stands, is can be very harmful for people who are not married. So think about um, one example would be um, migration law, which privileges marriage um, uh, over unmarried relationships. I mean, migration law has a whole host of problems relating to inequality, relating to um, wealth and class and where people come from and so on. But the question of marriage is one of those aspects of the injustice of the immigration law that needs to be addressed. Um, we can also think about um, problems with, for example, inheritance tax and the fact that married and civil partnership uh, couples get, um, get relief from inheritance tax that is not applied to other people who pass on their property. And again, that's an area that needs reform. So there's lots of areas of policy reform that we can sort of start with. Claire, thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks. Lovely to talk to you.